Sometime last year, I made a Twitter poll to see what sort of movies I could do for a marathon, including the Air Bud series and the Land Before Time sequels, but those who actually voted asked for the Herbie films, which is what we're here to do. Starting today, we're going to begin my little Herbie movie derby, and the very first film of its kind, The Love Bug. of the love bug began through a pitch by one of the stars of the movie, Dean Jones, who tried selling the idea of a serious, straightforward film project about the first sports car brought to the U.S., while Disney, who did have involvement with the film prior to his death in 1966, suggested they adapt the story of Car Boy Girl, which was written by Gordon Buford in 1961. In terms of the car they chose and why, well, they had a few selected, but ultimately chose the Volkswagen Beetle because it was the only one that elicited the crew to reach out and pet it. Uh, I'll settle for Dogbug. There's other things to note regarding some branding concealment and crap, as well as a few things that were done by the producer, Bill Walsh which I may bring up at my own discretion. Otherwise, directing duty goes to Robert Stevenson of Mary Poppins fame, though he also did Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, which was one of the many old-school Disney movies I've seen growing up. And like that, I remember watching The Love Bug quite a lot, along with Herbie Rides Again. But really, I want to take this chance to expand my horizons and look beyond the first two movies since I've only seen those two in their entirety. And hopefully I can get you interested in some more old school live action Disney movies. So, let's begin this race with The Love Bug. We begin with a little derby of sorts. And by derby, I mean destruction derby. What a way to introduce your movie, with morphing font that's meant to remind us that it's about a love bug only we see cars wrecking each other. And actually, the footage you see here is from the 1966 film Fireball 500, which I guess they allowed Disney to use, since they also allowed Chevrolet to use it for promo reasons. But now, watch as you see the driver in car 4B, or is that 48, crash only to crawl out in a red suit. Great continuity. This is Dean Jones' character, Jim Douglas. As you can see, he's a washed out racer reduced to destruction derbies and he's considerably old compared to the younger racers of today. He also seems to have no pride now that he has no car. He lives in an old firehouse along with his friend, and somewhat mechanic, Tennessee Steinmetz, played by the late Buddy Hackett, who also seems to be building some kind of car bot monstrosity. You can tell he cares for his roommate, since he tries to convince him to make a change for himself with funny stories. Yeah, what this little boy says, Tennessee Steinmetz. I said, what? He said, you ain't happy. Well, I went to Tibet, to a mountaintop, with swamis and monks. I discovered my real self. It was wonderful. This will actually come back later. He isn't just saying this to be funny. But Jim is stubborn and decides to go to this dealership he heard about. Ah, oh, the 60s and their mentality on women. Though that was kind of funny. Though he seems more interested in the cars rather than her. Though he is still a gentleman, I suppose. This is Carol Bennett, played by Michelle Lee who, unlike Cousin Mel, is in the winch and is quite considerate. She happens to work for the rather snobby British car salesman, Peter Thorndike, 
played by the late David Tomlinson, who you can easily recognize by his rather unique performances. But I think this car would suit you very well. <laughs> yes. Yes, it would. Uh, may I offer you a glass of sherry and a biscuit? I take it that the question of price does not greatly concern a gentleman like yourself. Oh, I wouldn't haggle, if that's what you mean. What price range did you have in mind? Now, I always have trouble remembering names for, like, actors and such, but I often can recognize them for how they act and sometimes appear. And David was certainly a favorite of mine for these older films. Whether he was a villain or a hero, he stood out and made himself as charismatic as possible. Here is no different, as he plays Jim off as someone he thinks might be rich, and a connoisseur of cars, until he finds out he's poor and he tries shooing him away. Moving on, though. Hey. Have a job! Well, now, where did this come from? And there's the star of the movie. He doesn't have a name yet, though for reference, I'll be calling him Herbie anyway. And even though this dealership mostly sells fancy cars, I guess even they still have what Jim asked for. Cheap transportation. Hey, what's that for? I beg your pardon. Well, why don't you let the little car alone? Are you presuming to tell me what to do in my own establishment? Okay, I'm out of line. Just bugs me to see somebody abusing a decent piece of machinery. Dude, you've been racing in destruction derbies. What the hell would you know? But I'm guessing sticking up for the little bug was enough for Herbie to follow him. Also decent effect of not showing someone driving or dragging the car along, though the actual effect involves modding the car so it can be driven from the rear seat, all the way to his home. Naturally, the police show up because Thorndike believes Jim might have taken it. Somehow, though if the police were to properly investigate the car for signs of tampering or anything, maybe they could clear this up. I'll do it, okay. I'll do it, but I just want to go on record. I have, I have seen some crummy stunts in my time used to sell cars, but this beats everything. Or Jim can have accused Thorndike of some kind of business stunt to get him to buy the car. Seriously, the car is pretty much returned at this point. No one can prove anything right now, so let the police handle it. But no, it seems because of some kind of legal mumbo-jumbo, Jim has no choice but to buy the car and deal with whatever payments that come from it, because clearly the rich are favored over the poor. Every. Single. Time. Uh, would you come with me, please? Uh... And then get Mr. Douglas and his acquisition out of here before I lose my temper! What Bill Walsh thought it would be funny for Herbie to spurt out oil at people he didn't like. Well, it worked. But even though this car is going to be racing pretty soon, he doesn't seem to like the freeway. car moved on its own. What does it mean? It must mean... This car is rigged! And apparently made out of rubber. Either that or all cars are indestructible during gag shots. Now granted, he is at least bringing up how the car seems to go against his will. It's just that we saw how he was being handled. So how does that explain the car moving on its own? If I were Jim, I'd be questioning if the car is haunted and if I should hire an exorcist. Carol volunteers to drive with Jim for a bit to see if what he said is true, and she doesn't find anything wrong. She also seems to recognize Jim and exposits what happened to him. Two years ago at Laguna Seca, you spun out and hung a beautiful Buick Special on the back fence. At Willow Springs, was it a year ago, last February, you sprayed a lotus all over the infield. How do you know all that? I have trouble with names and faces, but I never forget a car. I like good machinery. Now, why don't you give this little car a fair chance? You bought it. Enjoy it. Fair enough. But when they go to switch and these teens show up to taunt them, this happens. Did 
did you see this thing take off? One of your showboat tricks, Mr. Douglas. I tell you, I had nothing to do with it. Hey, we were turning. Now that time I can understand her reaction as possibly due to his actions. But then... One attempted murder transition later. I can't, can't seem to do anything with it. Mr. Douglas, I'm asking you nicely to pull over that curb and let me out. Okay, you clearly saw him hit the brakes, turn the ignition key, and try controlling the wheel. How the frick is it that everything that isn't normal right now is his fault? Herbie must really want to ship these two if he's taking them to a fast food joint to eat. Guess that's why they call him the love bug. No, it isn't. Though this bit is amusing. Can you help me, please? Help, I'm a prisoner! I can't get out! We all prisoners, Chicky Baby. We all locked in. A couple of weirdos, Guinevere. Huh, <laughs> it's funny because they're usually considered weird in their time. So eventually, Herbie decides to let Carol drive and prove Jim's point that yes, this car is messed up and possibly wants them to date. Well, Jim is kind of being an asshole to her at this point. But more importantly, how does no one think that the car is alive right now? None of these things are normal, and if it can drive on its own, without a driver, as we also see here, wouldn't the thought have hit them by now? You're really stretching how far their skepticism can go just for laughs. Only Tennessee seems to know what this means. We blew it. Okay, another kind of a civilization is gonna take a turn. Give me a 11 mil wrench, will you? I'm sitting up on top of this mountain, right? I'm surrounded by these gurus uh, and buddy. and buddy. Right? We take machines and we stuff them with information until they're smarter than we are. Take a car. Most guys spread more love and time and money on a car in a week than they do I on a I think wife he's losing and... himself. Okay, so basically he's saying that the car might be alive because machines are learning. Skynet or whatever. It's just mystical jarble to explain why Herbie is even alive. Jim thinks it's just something he can fix, and he plans to use him for racing to make him special. And just to prove that Herbie is part dog... Anyway, Tennessee gives Herbie his name after his uncle. Though incidentally, this is in reference to a Buddy Hackett skit, involving a German ski instructor, and one of Hackett's last lines mentioned him saying Herbie. Otherwise, Jim gives Carol some flowers to make up for the other day, and thus begins the racing portion of the movie. It's here Herbie is given his iconic colors and number, the latter of which is based on Bill Walsh being a fan of Don Drysdale of the Los Angeles Dodgers who bore that number. Naturally, Tennessee knows that Herbie is doing all the work, but I guess they don't want to break Jim's spirit that he's back into the thrill of racing again. Now, Carol brought Thorndike here just so she can watch Jim race, and after seeing him win, Thorndike issues a little deal. Mr. Douglas would like to get the remainder of his payments off his back. No doubt, but why should I think that's such a good idea? Well, if Mr. Douglas entered the race, he could bet his share of the little car against the remaining payment. What do you say, Douglas? Winner to become the sole owner of the car. A moment ago, you mentioned teaching me a lesson. Do I now detect a note of timidity? Racing. That's the name of the game, isn't it? Win or lose, put up or shut up. He's certainly getting cocky, but then again, so is Thorndike. Now, some of the racing parts are obviously either using authentic footage from wherever they're shooting, but also did a lot of chroma keying during the inside shots of the cars. If it weren't for some of the commentary, it seems like this might not come off too exciting. Now, like with most older films, it becomes really obvious when it looks to be real or when they chroma key something, even when it's not necessary. Still, they had to get the footage one way or another, and they do make these races seem a little exciting. 
which is part of the appeal to this film anyway. The other part? Just a moment, Mr. Thorndike. You don't have to... I demand that this thing is impounded and checked. I tell you, I tell you, there's more going on here than meets the eye. Is seeing Thorndike be humiliated by the thing he once kicked. So we get a montage of Jim participating in various races and winning them all. Even when Thorndike keeps showing up for these races. I guess he just really can't stand to lose and has to beat him in something. Even though he's not getting the car back. He even follows him into... Do you wanna? Yeah! Even against motorcycles, Jim manages to win this race. At this point, Thorndike is infuriated that he keeps losing and doesn't want to believe Jim is a better racer. But rather, he did something to the car. So, he decides to play dirty. He has Carol go on a date with Jim, since Thorndike might have put Jim up to possibly dating her, and even take the special yellow car with them as they enjoy a nice date together. I've heard that Jim Douglas is only interested in fast cars and easy money. Not true. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know something else? What? When the light hits you just right, you're as beautiful as General Grant on a $50 bill. At least it's not as rushed as in Monkeys Go Home. Meanwhile, Thorndike decides to sneak into Jim's home and tricks Tennessee into sharing a drink together out of showmanship or something, gets him drunk on Irish coffee, and then pours the remainder down Herbie's gas pipe. Numerous times, for that matter. How that doesn't wake him up is odd, but I'm also unsure of one little thing that I'll bring up in a bit. For now, it's race day again, and this time Thorndike's brought out a red car! He's certainly confident. Well, at first, it doesn't seem like nothing's changed regarding Jim's performance, but then... I'm surprised this didn't happen sooner, with how much of that stuff Thorndike put into him. How did it not happen any sooner? Tennessee finds out too late of what happened, and he can only watch as Herbie breaks down to the point that his wheels get crooked and his fender falls off? Huh. Well, even though Thorndike wins it, he doesn't get to go home unscathed. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> now here's where the film takes a somewhat dramatic turn, with Herbie feeling sick. But that's just it. A car is sick, and we're treating him like a person. Carol comes over, not only to say that she's no longer working for Thorndike, but she ends up helping Tennessee, who actually isn't a mechanic after all. Okay. He also slowly convinces her that Herbie is alive, while also revealing more about Jim's backstory as a failed racer, who had no self-esteem until Herbie came along. This does bring up the question about whether Herbie was the one doing the most driving, or if it was Jim, and also what would happen if he were to find out he wasn't the one in control. Would it break his spirit? As silly as the premise is that a car can even be alive, this is at least a unique way of going about overcoming failure by first restoring one's spirit with the aid of friends. Though, of course, since Jim is still in his stuck-up, I-can-do-anything phase, he ends up getting a new car for the El Dorado race that's coming up. Tennessee is of course mad that Jim could replace Herbie like that, but Jim doesn't want to believe that no one else but him was behind all of the victories. And yes, this is even with him knowing that Thorndike sabotaged his car. He just needs something better, that's all. I understand from a friend of mine that you purchased a new Lamborghini today. So? I'm also informed that you owe a great deal of money on it. Now myself, for sentimental reasons, I like the little car, and I'm perfectly willing to increase my previous offer and give you $1,500 for it. $1,500?! With that you could buy... a used car! Yes, I know this was before inflation, I just couldn't resist. 
It seems Jim is going to take the offer, and naturally, the others are upset that he's going through with it. This all seems like two parents arguing with each other about how they treat each other's possessions, while the child is pouting and trying to cope. But they're all single adults! Time, someone told you what the score is, you see, Tennessee's too tenderhearted. You really think it was you winning those races? Yes, I think it was me winning the- What do you mean it wasn't me winning those Not races? Me. Oh. Eventually, all this arguing leads to Herbie destroying Jim's new ride. Now Jim can believe that the car is alive, and he starts bashing him. Once he agrees that Herbie is jealous that Jim gets credit for the victories, he finally stops and goes to sulk before Thorndike comes by to give him the money. It's starting to sound like he even knows that Herbie is alive, but it doesn't matter because he's long gone now. And of course, this is a matter between the two of them that only Jim can solve. It does seem likely that Thorndike believes in Herbie's sentience, since he calls for his goons to track and collect Herbie. But in the meantime, damn, these shots look depressing! I love it. I almost dare say this is like how Oda made people care deeply for a pirate ship. This is some sad stuff, and it's making me feel really bad for the little bug, as Thorndike even tries having Herbie taken apart! Needless to say, after going through Chinatown and making a mess of this one guy's store, Jim finally catches up to Herbie, who was about to jump off a bridge? What the frick? I doubt anyone would think that the silly car movie would go as far as showing an attempted suicide from the sentient car. This is dark, like old Yeller levels of dark. Jim tries to stop him and nearly falls over in the process. He doesn't quite apologize, but Jim being in danger gets Herbie to save him, just in time for the police to show up. They impound Herbie so the Chinese businessman can inspect it. And a Chinese remix of Herbie's theme plays. Huh. Well, now comes another problem. Since Jim owns Herbie, he owes this guy a lot of money. And that's not even including what he owed for the other car. But good news! It seems Tennessee's little trip to Tibet taught him how to speak Chinese. So, what does he tell Mr. Wu? Kuntai, yikola. Ho ho. Jokne yotga hongi. Yeah, pretty much. He tells Mr. Wu that this is the famous racing car that's known even where he lives. Well, that's fine and all, but now he wants to keep Herbie for himself in exchange for dropping the charges. So, Jim decides to make a deal. If he can win, if he wins the El Dorado using Herbie, Wu can keep the prize money, but also has to sell Herbie back to Jim for only a dollar. His response? Now you speak my language. <laughs> now about the El Dorado. It's a massive race that goes through the Sierra Nevada mountains, going to Virginia City and back to Yosemite Valley. Thorndike, after hearing what Mr. Wu did for Jim, makes a wager with him that won't be known until later. Otherwise, Jim will be partnered with Carol in Tennessee to keep Herbie together, while Thorndike has his little Smithers henchman, Havershaw. That the race begins. Some of the footage feels a bit shaky, but it's pretty cool that we're having this cross-country race on what looks to be narrow roads. Of course, the real competition is between our heroes and the villains. No one else gets in the way. This gives Thorndike plenty of opportunities to cheat, such as having oil slicks, blasting through to make our heroes flip over, somehow and changing the gas tank to have water in it. How is he able to get away with this and not have the commentators catch on is beyond me. At least he gets karma a lot, 
Like early on, he gets stuck in a pond, and while getting his car out, a bear comes into his car, and he has a freak out. Also, when both sides are out of gas, he gets the really slow and old gas station attendant, while Team Douglas gets the young and fast team. Oh, and everyone in town loves them enough to help out. Well, sooner or later, after taking the lead again, Thorndike switches the road signs so everyone goes into a mine shaft. How they get unstuck is beyond me, but Team Douglas gets out by using an elevator. This deeply disturbs Thorndike's celebratory wine drinking, and he unleashes his most dirty tactic yet. He bumps the car slightly and one of Herbie's wheels falls off. Attempted murder? Well, I never. Though all of this just makes me question how Thornegg or Havershaw were able to get away with all this. When would they have time to do this? How would they have done all this? And not one person checked the damn car for any signs of sabotage. Never mind that the wheel thing could have happened any time during the spin outs or... Oh wait! They did service the car at the gas station and one of the people were clearly tightening the wheels. How the frick did this still happen? How is Thorndike getting away with all this? It just raises too many questions. So somehow, after losing two wheels, our heroes make it back using a wooden wheel they found. Overnight, Jim is worried that Herbie might break down during the next half of the race and is thinking of giving up and giving Woo Herbie now. If anything, it does show that for whatever reason that Herbie has for being alive, he has started to love and appreciate him, and wondered why he picked him of all people to be with. I guess it thought you were worth belonging to. I understand that. Anyway, since it sounded like Jim was quitting, Thorndike comes over, wanting to take Herbie since the wager was that the winner could keep him. He also starts spewing some really nasty comments about what he'll do to Herbie, and he goes one kick too far. Get your hand! Get your hand off! I hunger. Beware, I live. Run, run, run! Beware, coward! Run, coward! Well, that renews their hope for this race. Since they came in last, they start out last. But they do some really impressive catching up by taking some killer shortcuts. If anything, the stunt work in this is amazing for its time. Otherwise, like before, Thorndike cheats like a child. This time, he just bumps our heroes off the hill and into a tree, then pushes a log out in front of them as he's afraid that the car is after him. But he gets bumped into Herbie's front end, and they don't realize he's there until this happens. Well, good job! You threw out your back and are unable to stand anymore. I hope it was worth it. Now for the more memorable parts of this movie. They start seeing Herbie coming apart, and Tennessee tries to weld them together. But... Why do I feel like that's not at all what's supposed to happen? This is some scary stuff, but they can't stop now. Thorndike is coming! cheating the whole movie. Go to hell. But it gets better.
Yes, you are really seeing this. Herbie is actually racing himself with his own ass. And his ass is faster than his front half. Though in fairness, the ass is where his engine is. Even Thorndike doesn't know what to make of it. But either way, Herbie speeds through and wins. <laughs> Herbie's probably bleeding out as we speak. So I guess Wu's part of the wager was taking ownership of Thorndike's dealership, with Tennessee hired on as an assistant. Thorndike and Havershaw are forced to work for him now, and they of course fight each other. And after repairing Herbie, somehow, Jim and Carol go off, happily married. Let's go, Herbie. Well, that was as fun and exciting as I remember it. Definitely among my favorite old-school live-action Disney movies, for sure. The idea of a sentient car would definitely work best in an animated field. Well, depending on how you do it. But they managed to make it work wonders in a live-action setting. With what we see of him, Herbie comes off as a bit of a show-off when it comes to racing, mischievous when dealing with bad guys or putting people together in love, and a real trooper even as he's shown to break apart. He's also a real friend to Jim and was willing to put up with a lot of his crap until a certain point. But once Jim realized his mistakes as a troubled racer, they start coming together in an unorthodox but well-meaning manner. It's very much a Disney movie when they do something out of the ordinary that can still be funny and wholesome. The cast is very enjoyable, especially Tomlinson's performance as Thorndike. And despite a few technical faults in how some of the race footage was taken, not to mention the chroma key sequences getting used a lot, the effects and stunt work are at least superb for the time. In the way of accolades, it made over 10 times as much back in grossing at like $51 million domestically, and was the third highest grossing film of 1968, just behind Funny Girl and 2001 A Space Odyssey. It also won a Golden Screen Award in Germany. Doesn't say what, though. And Dean Jones was nominated for Male Comedy Performance. Very impressive for a movie about a sentient car, and well-deserved in my opinion. It would take a few years, but in time, they would take up the success of this movie and continue Herbie's journey in life. So stay tuned for next time, when Herbie rides again. Say, do you like dragons? How about adorable looking dragons that you can have as pins? Well, I know someone who has you covered. Please consider checking out and kickstarting Greenhouse Dragons an enamel pin set featuring some colorful dragons and their respective floral or fruits. More dragons will be revealed in time as more money comes in, but if you're extra generous, you can even work with the creator in designing a whole new pin. There's less than a month left before the campaign ends, so if you're in the mood for some new dragon pins, give this project a look.